splendor of the King, His clothes in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps Himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at His voice, trembles at His voice. Transfiguration of Jesus this morning. The transfiguration itself is it's like a foreshadowing vision of divine love. And, and what it does for us is it kind of allows us to see one another in a different way. It, it allows us to see each other as we really are. Our, our, our whole true divine selves. The, the person that God created us to be. Uh, while he knitted us in our mother's womb. It allows us to see that in each other. And as we reflect on Jesus' transfiguration, we also need to take the time to contemplate our own transfigurations, right? So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, would you please stand for our call to worship? <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Um, it's good to see everybody. We're missing a few people, but maybe they'll show up in a few minutes. Um, it's good to be here on this rainy day and be inside where we're dry and warm and with friends. Um, we have a few announcements this morning. Um, the Experiencing God study on Wednesday evenings um, is ongoing. Uh, it's bring your own dinner at 530 and the study begins at 6 o'clock. The facilitators for this are Bruce Hutchinson and Colonel Puckett. Uh, every Sunday morning at 1015, the Covenant class is working on the power of the names of Jesus. And it has been great. Um, Ash Wednesday is this week. It falls on Valentine's Day this year. Uh, we will have communion and the imposition of the ashes this Wednesday at 6 p.m. And this will be in... Um, We'll have this instead of the Bible study this week. Um, we'll have a Holy Week potluck service at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, March 27th. So be thinking about what you might could bring for that. Um, our next contemporary service will be March 24th, which is Palm Sunday. And Easter Sunday will be traditional. And... Um, that's all of the announcements right now. I'm going to get to you in just a minute, Bruce, for something else. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and read our scripture this morning. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. But even if our gospel is in some sense hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only to those who are perishing. Among them, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving to prevent them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves merely as your bond servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory and majesty of God, clearly revealed in the face of Christ. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning uh, and worship you and praise you. You are so worthy of our praise. And Father, I thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy towards us. And God, as we go out into the world, help us be the light of Jesus and just show everyone what it is to be a Christian by the way we act, the way we speak. And just, Father, just in our thoughts, we need to just think of you all the time so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. And God, be with Pastor Mark as, we, um, as he brings the message and open our eyes and our hearts to receive that message. And then let us take it out into the world. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Brenda mentioned the Wednesday night service. If you haven't come, it's not too late to start. That's the member's workbook. <laughs> it's a discipleship class, not a Bible study. Uh, there are 12 units. It's supposedly 12 weeks long. This last Wednesday night, and there's five days per unit that we're supposed to work on each day. Uh, last Wednesday night, we managed to get through day one of unit one. <laughs> so, if you haven't joined us, come on out. <laughs> There's still plenty to do in here. And to me, a lot of, a lot of thought-provoking questions. It's not, uh, like I say, this is not a Bible study. Uh, so, come on out and join us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful job, guys. Uh, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna piggyback on that. What did happen is we were learning how to be in a better relationship with God through Jesus Christ and with each other. And so in the process of trying to learn how to do that through the study, it took us that whole time just to get through that very first day. <laughs> and 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 what we realized is that the, the Getting through the study is not the important thing. 
building a better relationship with each other and with God through Jesus Christ is the important thing. So that's what we're working on doing better. And so we'll keep working on doing that. I'm going to move this. I can go here. In case somebody else needs to say something over there. <laughs> Could I have the ushers come forward, please? As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer our tithes and gifts to the Lord as an act of worship. Holy Father, I do ask that you bless the givings of these tithes by the power of your Spirit and the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. May it be so. Amen.
And he was transfigured, changed in form before them, and began to shine brightly with divine and regal glory. And his clothes became radiant and dazzling, intensely white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were having a conversation with Jesus. Peter responded and said to Jesus, Rabbi, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three sacred tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not really know what to say because they were terrified and stunned by the miraculous sight. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him and obey him. And suddenly they looked around and no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus expressly ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh man, oh man. There's this street corner in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville. For those Louisville, for those who, who have been there. Yeah. It, it, it's an unusual, it has this unusual historical marker on it. It's a cast metal sign and with, a, with a little scroll work at the top of it. Uh, in raised letters, it describes the significance of something that happened in that particular place. Now, uh, the big capital letters at the top say, a revelation. Okay? And, and it goes on to commemorate a spiritual vision. Now, the vision was from a man named Thomas Merton. He's a Trappist monk uh, and one of the best-selling spiritual writers of the 20th century. When Merton entered the order, he was a graduate student in English at Columbia University. 
Uh, he surprised everybody. They were not expecting him to go into uh, order of monastic monks. He, he knew by announcing he'd receive a, a call from God that, that people would be shocked, you know. Off he went, though, to Gethsemane Monastery and, and of the Trappist Order just outside of Louisville, and it would become his home for the rest of his life. Now, it's, it's interesting, though, because even called people, they struggle sometimes with their calling, whatever it might be. Merton, he didn't always have it easy. He, he, he had a hard time keeping the vows of staying there and being there all the time. He, he had this keen interest in the world outside of the monastery. He struggled to reconcile his contemplative life with what he could be doing in society. You know, what kind of work he could be doing for the, for the causes he felt passionate about. And he did. Civil rights and, and, and nuclear disarmament were among the things that he was very passionate about. So he wrote about these struggles in a number of best-selling books about spiritual life. Now, on March 18th in 1958, standing on that very street corner in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, watching the crowds of shoppers and office workers surge past him on the sidewalk, Merton had a vision that he felt was directly from God. Here's, here's how he describes it in his book. The book's called Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. Uh, a good read from what I hear. I didn't read the whole thing, just the excerpts. Okay. In Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people. That they were mine and I was theirs. That we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. I, I was, it was like walking from a dream of separateness I, I have the immense joy of being human. Uh, a member of a race in which God became incarnate. As, as the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me, now I realize what we all are. And if only everybody could realize this, but it, it can't be explained. There's no way of telling people that they are walking around shining like the sun. There's no way that they can perceive that. Think of that. All of us, as we run our errands, sit at our computers, open up a can of soup in the middle of the kitchen, are shining brightly like the sun. And, and we, don't even, we don't even know it. If the witness of scriptures is true, then the part of us that's most truly real, it is by the blessing of God, holy and shining. That is who we are. We're clay from a riverbank scooped up by the hands of the Creator and molded into God's own image and infused with the breath of divine life. That is who we are. Because of that, at least in God's sight, we do shine like the sun. Now let's leave the, the Trappist monk for, for right now and, and see what maybe the scientific world would have to say about something like this, this, this kind of wonder. Uh, a physicist by the name of Arnold Benz spends his days looking deep within the very molecules of which we are made. That's what physicists do. They try to unravel God's creation so that we can understand it better. That's their job. Uh, he, he might say it like this. Um, the carbon and oxygen in our bodies stem from the helium combustion zone of an old star. Two silicon nuclei merged in the early phase of a supernova explosion and they became the iron in our bodies, hemoglobin. The calcium in our teeth formed out of a supernova out of oxygen and silicon. The fluoride which we brush our teeth was produced in a rare neutrino interaction with neon. The iodine in our thyroid glands arose through neutron capture at the onset of a supernova. 
We are completely connected with the development of the stars in ourselves, part of cosmic history. Because what we are was formed from that beginning. Each piece of us formed from the beginning of what people call the Big Bang or the creation or whatever they might call it. We come from that. Now, maybe that's what the poet-songwriter Joni Mitchell was thinking about when she wrote Woodstock. You guys remember Woodstock? Uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young made it famous. I'll, I'll read you some of the lines. Well, I came across a child of God. He was walking alone along the road. And I asked him, tell me where you're going. This he told me. Well, I'm going down to Yasker's farm, going to join a rock and roll band. Got to get back to the land, set my soul free. We are stardust. We are golden. We're a billion-year-old carbon, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Yeah. And a truth in all of that. Now, we truly do. We shine like Jesus. And today's reading is about Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And here's how a physicist might conceive of what happened at that time with Jesus. What Jesus did was he reached into himself into the very core of this being, to that dark realm where electrons orbit nuclei, just like at the beginning of creation. And, and deep within those minute molecules, each one of the solar system unto itself, there's a luminescent playground of what physicists call subatomic particles. Right? And this, they, they, what they do is they, they like blink into life for like a millionth of a second, right? Before they wink out again. And each bright explosion is succeeded by another and then another until the shadowy realm is illuminated by this dancing energy within each one of us. The holy fire at the center of all things. The holy fire at the center of our very being. Uh, reaching deep into himself, not with his fingers, mind you, not with his hands, but with the power of his will, Jesus grasped the very light and pulled it outward until the fire within became the fire without. H have you ever been laying on the beach or laying out uh, on the deck or and, and, and you, the sun is bright and it's in your face and your eyes are closed tightly because the sun's kind of blinding? And what you do is you see the inside of your eyelids, don't you? Right? And they, they seem to like glow red, don't they? They seem to like glow red. Yeah. Maybe this is the sensation that Peter and James and John experience. As the cool darkness of the night sight suddenly just vanishes before them, it's pushed back by the man-shaped star standing a short distance away. They, they shield their eyes with their forearms because it's, it's so bright, they have to look away uh, or be blinded. But, but they never seem anything like it, and they've just seen enough to know that it's their master. Their master is they've never seen him before. Shining brightly. And beside Jesus are standing these two figures, a star man and another star man, like himself. Now somehow the disciples know them to be Moses and Elijah, the greatest of the prophets and the lawgivers. Great because in their times, each one of them had talked directly with God. Now, Peter feels the urge to fill this luminous silence with speech. But, but the words that come out of his mouth, they're, they're kind of foolish because he doesn't understand. You know, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. None of the three, by the way, pay attention to what he's saying. They, they, that, that's the least in their minds. They, they're not hearing his words because even then, right at that moment, a brighter cloud arises. The holy wonder, we talk about it in Hebrew scripture, we call it the Shekinah glow or the Shekinah glory. It, it's descending from heaven and surrounding these three shining stars that are before them. And from the cloud emerges his voice. It's, it's beautiful beyond all beauty and infinitely old. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him and obey him. And with that, the light winks out. Restoring the mountaintop to that natural darkness of the evening that they're there. 
Now, a few minutes pass before their eyes can fully adjust to the blackness again. In time, they see again the moon and the stars and, and uh, them winking around each other. And then they see that silhouette by their celestial light. They see their Lord walking toward them. A mere man, as he's always been. But in their, in their mind's eyes, they perceive him as something more than that now. They see him as something different. This is, this is how we glimpse glory sometimes. It's like that. And then bias, like the wink of an eye. You know? But we don't just see it in, in we see it in church sometimes, we see it in the music sometimes, we, we hear it in the scripture sometimes and see it there. We see it in people that we walk by daily. We see it, but it's like a glimpse. There's a, there's a say, it, it, it kind of goes like this, who dwells on the mountaintop anyways? There's no living to be scratched out there from the piles of rock at, at a summit, right? There's, there's no spring of water, there's no roof or shelter unless it's a rude lean-to that like Peter might make, right? <laughs> there's no thing there. Mountaintops are not for dwelling. You know what mountaintops are for? They're for a visitation from the holy. They're, they're for a place to reflect a place to see visions. The question for us is, in our spiritual lives, can we carry such a vision down from the mountain as we work our way back down the winding trail to the plains in which we dwell? Can we carry that message down the mountain to those who need it? In, in, in just a few days, on Ash Wednesday this year, I'm, I'm going to remind you, Ash Wednesday, 6 o'clock, See you then, I'll mash your head with the ashes. Okay? And um, it's also Valentine's Day, so I won't keep you very long, so in case you got a date, you can go on your date. Uh, that, that gentle holiday of flowers and hearts and boxes of chocolates and dinners and candlelight. And, and for the younger set, well, do you guys remember? We had those stacks of punch out Valentine's cards we take to school, remember? <laughs> We take those things to school, maybe even a handful of that, that chalk candy with the little things on it that say crazy for you or be my valentine or kiss me or something flirtatious, you know, mildly flirtatious, right? Now, it's easy to be in love on Valentine's Day. Uh, or, or at least it's easy to play at it, you know. It, it's far harder for any of us to sustain love. That's far more difficult. It, it, in, in a committed love relationship with another person, over time we'll experience ups and downs, things, things that break us and things that, that strengthen us. You know, We see them as those crazy detours in life, which happened to all of us. You know, there's this preacher, his name's Peter Marshall. He was, he was thinking about this very sort of thing, this forever love. And what he was doing is, he was thinking of his love for a long haul as he was speaking words to this couple that he was married. And I want, to, I want to say those words to you so you can enjoy them like I did. We are souls in living bodies. Therefore, when we really fall in love, when it's true love, it's, it's not this, just this physical attraction. All the physical attractions do happen. That's usually where it begins, Right? It, it, it's not just that. Because if it is just that, it's not going to last through the stretch of time. Now, ideally, it's also this spiritual attraction. God has opened our eyes and let us see into someone's soul. We have fallen in love with the inner person, the person who is going to live forever. We've fallen in love with that person. And that's why... God is the greatest asset to the romance of Valentine's Day, <laughs> right? After all, God thought it up in the first place, this thing of love, right? Showed us what it was and gave it to us. Uh, so he tells them, he says, look, guys, I need you to include the Lord in every part of your marriage. And God will lift it above the level of the mundane to something rare and beautiful and lasting and and. and, and Honestly, truer words were never spoken for marriage or any other loving relationship, truly. Right? Part of the secret of loving another deeply and well is this very matter we've been considering today. 
that we call it spiritual vision. Where we can see. Now we're working on that. That's what we're working on on Wednesday nights, isn't it guys? Is to have a spiritual vision so we can see where God's at work and become part of that, right? Such vision, which depends not on eyes at all, permits those who are married to glimpse their beloved ever so briefly as the spiritual being he or she truly is. It, it matters not uh, the, the measured stride of the beloved as it grows hauntingly and haltingly. The grip that grows weak, the eyesight that grows dim. Uh, for the spiritual being itself is ageless, even though the body is not. Right? It, it's blazing from this eternal immutable flame. Right? And it cannot be quenched by anything, neither light nor darkness, neither death nor life. You all get what I'm saying, right? It cannot be quenched. As it says in the first letter of John, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him. For we will see Him as He truly is. We will be like Him. It's not unlike the epiphany, the mystical vision experienced by the celibate monk, Thomas Merton, in 1958, as he stood on the corner of 4th and Walnut in Louisville. Those people around him, he perceived, were not as they seemed. And many times what we look at when we see human beings is we see less than what they are. And what we really need to be looking for is the more. More than what we can see. There, there's no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun. When I tell you at the end of this morning that you bless me, that I'm blessed by being around you, I'm telling you that I've seen the light in you, the very light of Jesus Christ. And that's the blessing I feel. Shining like the sun. Now, it's a rare and precious thing to glimpse such a glory. Right? We don't see it all the time in each other. Matter of fact, we have to make an effort to see it. Because the world is stubborn with beating us down. And the evil one is always playing on our eye tricks. You know? Yet now and again, if we're attentive to these things that are unseen, we too may be so blessed as to catch a flicker of the way things really are. In this god dream universe of passionate, divine fire and love. Right? And in the process, see God's holy creation shine in each person that we encounter. And, and I pray this for each and every one of us. May the world be our agape Valentine this year. May we see that we are all human beings on this earth together and that we shine like Jesus shines. May that be so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I hope you glean something from that this morning. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join me as we sing hymn 452, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
Thank you, everyone. Please receive this benediction. I pray that God is everywhere you are and, and every moment you have today. To your right and to your left, above you and underneath you, behind you and in front of you. And you're rising in the morning and you're going to sleep at night. I, I, I do pray. I'm not, I'm not saying this because it's, it's been evident to me the last week or so. Each circumstance that I've encountered this last week or so, I've had a choice to take it in a loving and kind and, and I don't know, compassionate and, and positive way. Or I've had the choice to take it in a negative way and get upset about it and, and maybe even get angry and say harsh words. And, and I've realized that every time I make the choice to go to the light, to the positive way, I feel better. And, and it's hard to do because there's a lot today that can drag us down. But keep in mind, we are divine. Our true home is not necessarily here. Who we are has not yet been revealed. But we choose to do the positive, to think the positive, to wish better things upon people even if they are hurting us. And when we choose to, that, to do that, we feel better. So, take the journey with me. I am going to try in this year to choose to take the positive route. The best I can, no matter what the circumstances are. Please take that with you today. And choose the positive. Choose the good. Choose the love. Choose the light. Choose the Jesus in each person. Choose to see that. May that be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, everyone. Amen. Just the right timing to have that clicker. I'm glad we got it. <laughs> hey, Mark. Yes, Mark. I'm going to be here Sunday, next Sunday. Okay. No, no. Mike's, Mike's going on a business trip, and he's leaving about 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so, yeah. So she's got a fill in. So I did swap with David. <laughs> you swap with David? We're going to swap. Yeah. We're going to swap. I was supposed to do it the next Sunday, so she's going to... Okay. Well, does that mean you're going to come up and stand at the mic and sing hymns with Dale? <laughs> I mean, I that's my stand, next... I can come up and stand in the mic. I don't know about the other part. He might run people off. Well, if Dale sings, I'll just get up there and just pantomime. And let my, <laughs> and his voice will be what I, people are hearing. <laughs> oh.
and your, your camera is on that. Oh, I'm glad you said. We, record, we recorded all that.